in this episode I'm going to propose to you a wholesale replacement for Darwin's theory of evolution by natural selection based on intraspecies competition. What I'm going to propose to you is that evolution is entirely algorithmic. Nature is behaving like a big computer and what's forcing it to make computer calculations or computing steps, the CPU if you like, is the strange interaction between the water molecule and the DNA molecule. The fundamental algorithm is not Darwin's mechanism. Darwin's mechanism was socio-economic. It's really just faith-based voodoo and not a really scientific, rigorous concept. It's a nebulous thing. If nature really is algorithmic, then there's no logical operator for competition that makes any sense at all. First, let's talk about algorithms and why biological life qualifies as algorithmic. All life requires DNA. And just like a computer, the DNA molecule encodes a well-defined sequence of biological instructions. Algorithms can be compact and simple, yet when executed they can lead to incredibly complex expressions, forms and behaviours, especially if they are iterative. John Horton Conway was a British mathematician who died just recently in April 2020 from COVID-19. Ironically, he was known for being able to calculate the day of the week for any given date in his head in about two seconds. He did it using his invention of the Doomsday Rule, a quick way of mentally calculating the day of the week by working back from an easy to remember Doomsday. For example, the last day of February, the 4th of the 4th, the 6th of the 6th, the 8th of the 8th, the 10th of the 10th, and the 12th of the 12th all occur on the same day of the week in any year. And yes, before you ask, he died on a doomsday. The 15th doomsday of 2020, to be precise. You've got to be careful of that kind of thing. 50 years ago, in 1970, Conway became famous for inventing a cellular automation called Conway's Game of Life. It was based on Stanislaw Ulam's cellular automata. That I hate it. That I hate the game of life. Conway's game of life is the perfect way to explain the complexity of life to your alien cortex in its own native language. It's a zero-player game played on an orthogonal grid of squares, colored black or white, based on these four simple rules. Any live cell with fewer than two live neighbors dies, as if by underpopulation. Any live cell with two or three live neighbors lives on to the next generation. Any live cell with more than three live neighbors dies, as if by overpopulation. Any dead cell with exactly three live neighbors becomes a live cell, as if by reproduction. What emerges are still lives, oscillators, and spaceships that migrate across the space forever. The most important thing about it is that, although it's remarkably simple, it can nonetheless act as a von Neumann universal constructor from the cyberneticists of the 1940s that I mentioned in previous videos. Essentially something that can be set up to recreate itself. It's a self-replicating machine. Simple as it is, Conway's game of life is fractal in that it has self-similarity at different levels. Indeed, here is Conway's game of life implemented in the game of life Turing machine itself. Understand that and your head should explode. What Darwin failed to understand is that nature and perhaps the very fabric of the universe itself is fractal. Just one look at this broccoli and you can't doubt that it's the result of a fractal process. This anastomosis in the vein skeleton of a hydrangea leaf is also fractal and it didn't evolve that way through competition. In the algorithmic beauty of plants, Przemyslav Przinkiewicz and Aristotle Lindemeyer espoused the developmental algorithms and self-similarity in plant development. 
Lindemeyer systems were conceived of as a mathematical theory of plant development. They start with an initiator and have a generator applied to them recursively. These are known as rewriting systems. In nature, the initiator was the first living organism, the last universal common ancestor, or LUCA. Life was only initiated once and never again, and the generator algorithm has been ticking along merrily now for 3.7 billion years. 3.7 billion and one years in 2021. All life is fractal. A tree is fractal. Although Darwin was functionally enumerate, a mathematical, and predated the idea of fractals, even his iconic tree of life is fractal, had he only known it. When you look at a diagram of life like this, you're looking at strong evidence that the DNA molecule is a fractal engine. The ubiquity of phi in nature, obvious symmetries of form, and now often the golden ratio crops up, all hints at the fractal nature of life in general. This whole field of research is a scientific backwater called mathematical and theoretical biology. So what makes biological systems fractal? Well, let's call this the three F's or fractal theory of evolution. Life is fractal primarily because of these three essential physical processes. Feedback loops, focal points of attraction and repulsion, and filters. And that's it. Those describe the fundamental processes of biochemical life, the gradual evolution of greater and greater complexity of life, the origins of order in living beings, and ultimately a foundation for beginning to understand human consciousness. It's because of these three mechanisms that order arises from disorder, apparently in defiance of the second law of thermodynamics. As a governing principle, let's think of biological evolution in terms of energy. What governs everything is Maupertuis' principle of least action. First, let me describe the principle of least action, the fundamental law that's driving the whole mechanism. The principle of least action is usually described using the analogy of a drowning person and a lifeguard. What's the quickest route to the swimmer? Let's say that the lifeguard can run five times faster than he can swim. Therefore, if he takes a direct route, he'll be taking the shortest path, but it will take an unnecessary amount of time, perhaps 5 seconds on the beach and then 25 seconds swimming, which makes a total of 30 seconds. Now, what if he runs to a point where he minimizes his time swimming? Then he might run for 13 seconds and spend only 15 seconds in the water. That's a big improvement, but is it the best he can do? By successive approximations, the lifeguard would find that the quickest time of all would be a more oblique angle. Ultimately, he would reach an optimum path of, say, 8 seconds running and 18 seconds swimming, and that would be the ultimate best he could do. That would be his path of least time, and also the path of least work and energy expenditure. And that, in a nutshell, is Pierre-Louis Maupertuis' principle of least action. In the middle of the 18th century, Maupertui pointed out that refracted light always took the path of least time and least action. But his critics argued that that was a kind of teleology. How did the light know which was the shortest path? They lampooned him, saying that light couldn't be that intelligent. How could light be smart? In the 1950s, Richard Feynman answered by saying that light takes all possible paths and therefore the resultance is the least action. Well, the beautiful girl is drowning here, and you're the lifeguard. And you can swim slower in water than you can run on land. Where do you uh, hit the water? You rush this way to the water and swim like hell. <laughs> now, here's the result is when the time is changing slowly. In other words, it's a minimum or a maximum. Minimum. Now, in this particular case, like most things that Feynman said, it's all rather showy and glitzy, but when you look closer, it doesn't have much substance. I think the real reason that light manages to find the path of least action is because of self-interaction. I could devote dozens of these videos going deep into the principle of least action and how light actually finds the perfect path. 
But in the interest of time, let's just say that the reason why nature appears to have an intelligent design is because the principle of least action makes it look that way. It's an engine of smartness at the core of evolution. There have always been two competing views of science. The one of Leucippus, which says, nothing happens by chance, but everything for a reason and by necessity. And the atomist view of Democritus, which says, everything existing in the universe is the fruit of chance and necessity. But both agree on the point of logical necessity. It's the kind of inescapable necessity that makes the internal angles of a triangle add up to 180 degrees on a flat surface. An ironclad necessity that clips the wings and constrains even an omnipotent god. Why the intelligent design crowd is on the wrong track is because there's no intelligent decisions for a designer to make. If nature is fractal and evolution is algorithmic, then the apparent decisions are all forced moves. There's a certain indefinable isness, which you can only marvel at. And the upside is that although it's more powerful than any conceivable god, it doesn't require you to bow down and worship it. But how does nature's pursuit of least action cause living things to climb Mount Improbable? At first glance, it may appear that in the pursuit of least action, you would descend Mount Improbable rather than ascend it. If you think about the iconic Darwinian lion pursuing a gazelle, then one might be forgiven for thinking that least action implies that antelope should run towards lions, gleefully hoping to be eaten rather than running away and apparently hoping to live. Surely the perfect pursuit of least action is just to die and get it over with. Surely everything should just melt down and not up. Well, everything that happens in life is because of the diabolical nature of the DNA and RNA molecule. The DNA molecule causes extreme complications for energy just trying to go on its merry way to dissipate and reach a state of diffused entropy. The three Fs complicate things and impede the universe's natural course towards a universal heat death. From energy's point of view, all matter in the universe is slowly decaying up from the heavier elements at the bottom end of the periodic table through the process of nuclear fission. At the same time, lighter elements are moving down from the top through the process of nuclear fusion. Ultimately, everything converges on iron 56, and that's the end of the road for all physical material in the universe, effectively the end of the universe's story. But in the meantime, this energy cascade has to contend with the troublesome DNA molecule using the principle of least action, and it's tough. Darwinists sometimes say that it's kind of like a whirlpool or an eddy in the energy cascade, and in a way that's kind of right. Life is a case of a strange thing happened to me on the way to complete entropy. What the DNA molecule is doing in terms of an energy field is causing a short-range, local, premature optimization at the expense of long-range optimization and equilibrium over the entire field, in other words, the entire biosphere. What makes life complex is nature trying to resolve an intractable conflict against short-range optimization and long-range equilibrium. In a way, it's analogous to nature perpetually trying and failing to square the circle. People often compare the DNA molecule to writing because it seems analogous to writing in the sense that it's two conflicting regimes in transverse. What I mean by that is, take for instance the vertical axis, it readily resolves itself into its base pairs. It finds the optimal energy configuration very easily on one axis. But in the orthogonal, say, horizontal axis, Almost any arrangement of letters in any sequence is as good as any other from an energy point of view. So to find the absolute energy equilibrium, in a sense it has to refer out to a bigger context, and a bigger context still, and that context is the wider environment. It's kind of like an intractable hair-splitting court case to find the best optimal energy configuration. Writing can also be imagined as a Conway-like game on an orthogonal grid. The rules are strict in the vertical dimension, in that you are only allowed to populate each square from a very limited character set, maybe only one of 26 letters plus a space and a few punctuation marks. But in the lateral dimension, the rules are very loose. There are no rules for ordering the sequence of letters horizontally. 
hence the great complexity and richness that writing affords us. The rules in the vertical direction can be verified immediately, but in order to verify the sequence in the horizontal direction, we have to call out to a wider context, maybe an audience of literary critics or editors or fact-checkers. If the rules for the DNA molecule were rigid in both directions or free-form in both dimensions, then evolution couldn't happen. So the conflict between rigidity and flexibility is the essence, the yin and yang of life. This makes the DNA molecule a really difficult customer for a dissipative energy system that's trying to find the path of least action to complete equilibrium at all levels over the whole system. Although the biochemistry of life appears to be violating the second law of thermodynamics, in reality it isn't. The second law of thermodynamics implies that for a chemical reaction to spontaneously happen, it needs to progress linearly from a higher energy state to a lower ground state, in one direction without returning. So how does life apparently defy this law and create more order? Darwin's contention that it was competition that did it just doesn't hold water. Boltzmann's formula says that under the iron weight of the laws of thermodynamics, competition would run down too. So how does it do it? The answer came from the Soviet Union in the 1950s when Boris Balyusov discovered and described oscillating chemical reactions, something that was previously thought to be impossible. In chemical reactions, especially biochemical reactions, reagents generally catalyze other reagents. Things like peptides can sometimes do this in a long series or chain reaction. The question is, what would happen if one of the reagents in a chain just happened to be the chemical concoctions you started with in the first place? No one had asked the question before because few people before Belyusov had come across such a thing and those that had couldn't easily comprehend what they were looking at. While working on the effects of nuclear radiation on humans, Belyusov stumbled on an oscillating reaction that seemed to defy everything that was known about chemistry because it returned to its original state and then amazingly kept on recycling over and over, seemingly without end. You can see the reaction here cycling through four colors and returning to the composition it had at the start of the reaction. It does eventually run down so it's not violating the second law, but it oscillates for a surprisingly long time. Belyusov submitted his discovery to the Soviet periodical The Journal of General Chemistry in 1951. However, his article was instantly rejected on the grounds that what he had discovered was impossible. The mechanism he described contradicted the second law of thermodynamics. He tried to publish his work again in 1955, but it was still rejected in peer review in utter disbelief. It was only later, in 1961, when another Soviet researcher called Anatol Zabotensky rediscovers Belyusov's work, and it was published in full and taken seriously. For his trouble, Zabotensky rather than Belyusov became known as the father of nonlinear chemical dynamics. Many scientists have since realized that oscillating chemical reactions are the essence and secret to life. If you look at the belyusov zabotensky reaction in a Petri dish, it even looks organic. And very reminiscent of Tibetan and Chinese cloud art. This is the key to how life beats the second law of thermodynamics that I talked about in the last video. And this is the primary reason why all life is fractal. To be fractal, everything has to be recursive. The essence of life is tail recursive cycles. All living processes in nature are just biochemical and natural cycles acting as nonlinear oscillators. They are the feedback mechanisms and the first F in the three Fs theory. It's no accident that Belyusov made his discovery of oscillating reactions while working on the Krebs cycle or citric acid cycle, which is used by all aerobic organisms to release stored energy from carbohydrates, fats and proteins. The reason why we call it the circle of life is because nature is all about iterative cyclical processes. There's the nitrogen cycle, the carbon cycle, oxygen cycle and the phosphorus cycle to name but a few. 
all living things contain oscillating reactions. Cell morphogenesis, biological clocks, even the beating of a heart. So it's strange that Zabotinsky's work, which finally gave birth to nonlinear chemical dynamics, was only revealed to the world as late as 1968. Belasov's findings and explanation was only fully published in 1981. Carbon-based life is an Ouroboros that not only eats its tail, but also recreates itself. No one really knows how life made the transition from non-living to living organisms, but now you know what Darwin didn't. Now you know the engine of increasing complexity and self-organization in life. You can get a good idea of how feedback leads to self-organization and increasing complexity by getting a camera and pointing it at its own monitor. Feedback led to molecular self-replication and self-assembly through dynamical attractors and autocatalysis. But it could not have happened without the semiporous containment provided by the emergence of cell membranes. Those are the essential filters which provide systemic closure. I'll come back to that in a future part of this video episode. The LUCA used the wood Lewingdahl or reductive acetyl-CoA pathway to fix carbon. There's evidence that the wood Lewingdahl chemical reaction preceded life and was a precursor to LUCA. So maybe LUCA was just carrying on where inorganic chemistry left off. Self-replication is the most important property of life, yet no one really knows how it arose. Self-replication is a program that requires a complex choreography executed by molecular machinery in cells that are far too complex to have formed by chance. One suggestion is that simple peptide networks may have become able to cooperate and hence replicate together, forming autocatalytic sets. But there's a problem. DNA transcription and replication is mind-bogglingly complex. While simple RNA chains might conceivably assemble in a primordial soup, it's not clear how it evolved to become DNA, since DNA is responsible for RNA. No one really knows how to get over that chicken-and-egg problem. One person who has come close to solving the mystery is Stuart Kaufman. In 1993, Kaufman came out with a book called The Origins of Order, Self-Organization and Selection in Evolution. In it, Kaufman proposed how complex systems could exhibit spontaneous order through feedback mechanisms. Self-organization could arise automatically from closed autocatalytic or self-creating reactions. Kaufman used random Boolean networks to investigate genetic self-organizing properties of gene regulatory networks, proposing that cell types are dynamical attractors in gene regulatory networks and that cell differentiation can be understood as a transition between attractors. Kaufman's book is a formidable work of mathematical biology. Everything that needs to be catalyzed in its formation, a catalytic task, they're all done. All nine tasks are done. Let's call that functional closure. It's a very important property that is entirely missing from Richard Dawkins' notion of the selfish gene. He hasn't the faintest idea of functional closure. And he's a very smart guy, but he doesn't. He's just thinking about replicating genes and the meme theory of cultural evolution. Personally, I think Stuart Kaufman should be given 
the Nobel Prize for his work on the origins of order, and then it should be summarily stripped from him in disgrace for professional cowardice in not going the whole hog and just saying what he was really intending, and that's that Darwin was wrong. No peptide catalyzes its own formation. The set as a whole has a property that every peptide gets to exist in the set because it helps catalyze the formation of the other peptides in the set such that the whole exists and it's precisely a Kantian whole. It's a very simple example of it. It's an autopoetic system. Each part exists for and by means of the whole. Autopoesis means self-creating, auto meaning self and poesis to make or create. It's the same word we use for poetry. The term was introduced by three Chilean biologists in 1972, Humberto Maturana, Federico Varela and Ricardo Uribe. And they introduced it to describe the self-maintaining mechanism of organic living cells. They were known as the Santiago School, and for a while in the 70s, their radically new approach to biology caused quite a stir. El tema de la igualdad, bueno, pero son, no somos iguales, somos todos distintos. ¿En qué estamos diciendo? ¿De qué estamos hablando? But their ideas eventually ran out of steam. Autopoiesis has been just too poetic and too foreign for most biologists. The idea for autopoiesis and self-organizing systems had their origins with cybernetics and the Macy Foundation, which I talked about in previous videos. No doubt you'll remember Norbert Wiener, who introduced the idea of feedback loops to describe the way in which a system can maintain its material identity while interacting with an ever-changing environment. Margaret Mead, Gregory Bateson, and in particular Heinz von Forrester became very interested in the notion of cybernetics of cybernetics, or second-order cybernetics. It has been characterized as cybernetics where, quote, circularity is taken seriously, unquote. I guess we're going to cover some, some questions of what is a living system, which is, I think, a very hard thing to define, but perhaps you could try, Heinz. I sure I would try. <clears throat> I think what evolved in the last 20 years is something like that. Essentially, under the influence of cybernetic thinking, namely the circularity of processes, the notion of self-organization, the first thought that came about, has life really only to do with reproduction process? What's going on? Constantly circularity between a little bit of organization, fostering more organization, etc., etc. If you have a system which consists of many components, uh, and these components interact with each other in a productive way, producing some other components, when the system is organized such that the production of these components are the very components that do this production, then you have an autopoietic system, and then you have a living organization. Because biological systems are fractal, they have self-similarity at various zoom levels. Closed cycles generate the opportunity for second-order and higher-order parasitic cycles. The life cycle of a lion is a closed parasitic cycle that runs on, and is entirely dependent on, the back of the antelope grass photosynthesis fermentation fertilization cycle, which is actually part of the nitrogen cycle. Note that as long as there is sufficient energy, then a closed Kantian set can produce byproducts, that provide the opportunity for parasitic closed feedback loops to make new feedback cycles and so on. Remember that aerobic life, including our whole civilization and industrial economy, is really just one huge oxidation reaction. And that free oxygen only exists because it was an accidental byproduct of anaerobic cyanobacteria, which were merrily lazing in the sun fixing carbon dioxide in the photosynthesis cycle. This was called the Great Oxidation Event, and it happened 2.4 billion years ago. It was a catastrophe for most of the microorganisms that produced the oxygen, because for most of them their byproduct was poison. But it was literally the breath of life for aerobic species like ours. When delusional economists tell you that our civilization is slowly becoming decoupled from nature, just remember that we are merely a second-order, closed, autocatalytic feedback loop 
piggybacking off the cyanobacteria in the ocean. So if we are really about to become decoupled, according to the fractal theory of evolution, that implies that we're about to go extinct. I think it's a scientific fact that economists are slowly becoming deranged. Competition is a delusion. There really are no apex predators. The lion is just a second order closed parasitic loop that is dependent on the antelope portion of the carbon cycle. And the fleas on the lion are a third order loop and so on. So life is not evolving to be fitter. Rather, closed autopoietic cycles are becoming tail recursive and amplifying some process or other based on whether it provides a more optimal, yet ultimately more confounding, path of least action to dissipate energy. The reason antelope don't normally run towards lions is because that would fatally break the autopoietic feedback cycle that they're part of. It's my contention that immortality is probably just around the corner. And, uh, not necessarily through biology, but possibly through being able to read out the data in someone's... Uh, in what sense do you refer to immortality? Would you immortality. say Aristotle is immortal because we still yeah, read... To, to an Aristotle? extent. But if I could read out, say, all the information in my brain and then put that on a tape... But at the moment we have... And there's a cautionary tale in that too for anyone like Gilgamesh who seeks immortality. Since humans are also part of a mesh or web of mutually supporting feedback cycles, any attempt to extend life linearly will likely only stress and eventually break a closed feedback loop. And so you're more likely to achieve the opposite result. Instead of immortality, you will be rewarded with premature death. What you're really trying to do is make something linear that only exists because it's circular. The origin of species is not competition, it's whatever biogenetic process closes an autopoetic feedback loop. And evolution is not about adapting to an environmental niche, it's about navigating a local path of least action. It's not about survival of the fittest, it's about amplification of an optimal path of least action. Now in the next video I'm going to introduce the next of the three F's focal points of attraction and repulsion and their contribution. The total amount of suffering in the natural world is beyond all decent contemplation. For most animals, the reality of life is struggling, suffering and death. Oh, for pity's sake, give it up. No, rapid increase in population which inevitably would lead to competition 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 you are a Kantian whole okay you, you are